Um, now, I've um, <coughs> chosen a subject which is, frankly, uh, rather testing for me because it's. Um, I'm going to talk an, about economics, but rather indirectly. Uh, the economists I've known, I've been reading Hans's book on the methodology of the Austrian school. The economists I've known in my time were the old generation who um, knew about other things. You know, they knew their history and you could talk to them about literature. Um, the economists nowadays I find really rather odd. If I have um, economic students, I say things like, the gold standard. And they say, I mean, it's, it's as if I was talking about archaeology. <laughs> <laughs> and they busy themselves with mathematical sums, which I think the Austrian school hated, didn't it? And um, when they come up with big, when you come up with big questions, uh, they're a bit stumped. Uh, there was a moment when the Queen uh, opened something at the London School of Economics and one doesn't really expect tactless remarks from the Queen but she did say why in the name of God didn't you predict the economic crash of 2008? <laughs> what are they there for? No. <laughs> so I won't pretend to be able to take on the economists on anything like that kind of level um, what I'd like to do is something else, is um, uh, just consider where the Austrian school came from and um, <coughs> uh, also to compare it with uh, what I know, which is not much, about, um, <laughs> about uh, the origins of the particular English approach to it, or British, I suppose. Um, now, <coughs> Uh, uh, the Austrians, Mises, Hayek, Schumpeter, uh, all still read and still very well worth reading. I mean, I get more out of them than, shall we say, Paul Krugman repeating himself in the New York Times. Or I'm sad to say Joseph Stiglitz, who keeps writing a book about you know, the coming crisis of capitalism and how the World Bank should deal with it or something, as if the 1970s never actually happened. No sense of history there. Um, and uh, the Austrians came into their own again in the 1980s, when I think it's fair to say, you know, you could sense, uh, I won't call it civil war, but uh, an atmosphere of crisis in this country, where there was a military coup and where 20 people were being killed every day, there was a crisis in England, uh, and it was a very bad time. And it was good to be around in the 1980s when people started looking at uh, the, shall we say, the, um, I have to use the word pre-Keynesian, although it's not really quite accurate, uh, School of Economists. Now, I think um, for all this subject, it's worth uh, thinking back to what I always think of as the first Fukuyama. It's the 1860s. You could think in the 1860s that history was at an end. Uh, a formula had appeared by which the <coughs> political economy of the next forever uh, was coming up. It's parliaments, constitutions, a national bank, the nation state. You fight wars of national unification, not least in America, uh, Italy, Germany, and so on. The nation state, the national language, education, all these things are supposed to, to you wave a wand and progress then happens. Now, uh, Ludwig von Mises said that um, uh, classical liberalism was victorious with economics and through it. And uh, although the classical liberal parties lost power at the end of the 1870s, um, what Mises said is by and large true. We now think of ourselves 
as being in a world of tremendous change brought about by information technology. And it's no doubt true. But if you'd been alive in 1860 and could look back in 1900, you'd have said you'd been through a terrific period of change. I'll give you just a little example that uh, I remember from my own extreme youth. When I was about eight, my mother took me to see a friend of hers. Uh, and uh, that friend's grandmother was bedridden. And, uh, but her mind was all right. And she was, must, she was about 100. And I even, even then was sort of interested in the history. And she described a dental operation in 1848. The little girl with toothache is sat on a barnyard table. A string is attached to the tooth and the other end of the string to a barnyard door. The little girl is fed uh, two very large bottles of whiskies, uh, whiskies and the door is slammed. Um, half the tooth came off. <laughs> so she was given another couple of whiskies. <laughs> And they dug the tooth out with the sort of thing that you take stones out of horses' hooves. Now, a dental operation in 1900 is another case altogether because they have ether. And by the time my son was in the audience, um, was uh, you know uh, going to the dentist, he regarded it just just the same as going having a haircut. Now, that kind of progress multiplied everywhere, everywhere. Uh, you start off with horse and carts in 1860. Somebody's coming up with the principles of jet, of the jet engine in 1900. Uh, a Russian is coming up with the principles which will launch the Sputnik into space in 1903, that kind of thing. I don't need to ram this home. And it's, it's a terrifically interesting time with bursts of progress everywhere, and uh, that is the background to it. Now, uh, it's, I don't want to sound unpatriotic, really I don't, but you don't regard uh, modern England. Scotland, where I'm from, is a little better. Um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't regard modern England as a particularly efficient state. It, uh, it, uh, it has a ministry of death. It has a ministry of immobility, um, and it's, uh, you know, as Tony Daniels has said, we have achieved the unique achieve feat of combining prosperity with discomfort. <laughs> <laughs> However, in the 1860s, this miracle period, um, England is at the top of everybody's mind. How do they do it? Um, London, for instance, abolished cholera about 30 years before Hamburg did. It built the first elaborate underground railway, which was a very considerable engineering feat. When the Crystal Palace went up for that exhibition, it was more or less three weeks from idea to draft, and then another couple of weeks before it got built. There's a wonderful book on this by Andrew Wilson. And England's the country people look at, and they say, how is it possible? Constitution, um, and the, the key seems to be the adaptation of old institutions. Uh, for instance, the local government in England was run through the parish vestry, as it was called. Justice is not particularly, uh, it's, they didn't make a fuss about it too much. It, um, it, uh, and a local government in England, right up to 1914, consisted of a man with a booming voice and the sort of face that you want to measure the hypotenuse of the, the square of the hypotenuse for, and one secretary, and he runs the place. And they create places like Leeds and Glasgow. Uh, it's all done with, um, uh, with we call it privatization, 
And it seemed to work remarkably well. I think the same is true for the states, although I'm, I'm, got, I'm on territory I don't really know there. And <coughs> uh, England did seem to be the country which you had to imitate. Uh, my favorite Italian prime minister is a man called Agostino de Bretis, who dyed his beard white in order to look like Gladstone. And, <coughs> and uh, so it was until, well, things changed a bit. And on the whole, Germany became the model. But England seemed to operate on a principle of privatization. Now, uh, and if you look at English economics, I'm sorry, I keep using English as a shorthand. It's, uh, um, it, it's British, of course. And uh, <coughs> if you look at English economics, it's, it's, it's got a moral, a, a moral component to it. The Cambridge Economics Faculty was actually, called, were actually part of the, what was called the Faculty of Moral Sciences, and that's where Marshall came from. Now, the English state ran into troubles. It was a product of a unique period when England produced one third, one half, of the world's trade, and of course, most of the uh, with France, most of the investment. It was a world which, in nature, couldn't last because the Germans, the Americans, picked up and uh, worked things better. And England, well, the state had to take things on, and the making of the English state was really Ireland. You know, the the unique trick in English history is the abolition of the peasant. In 1900, 8% of the British population lived on the land. Compare that with France, 50, Italy, 60, and so on. And if you're not dealing with peasants, life is a lot easier if you're one way or another, not least with cheap food. And, uh, but you, they ran into the problem of Ireland where the peasant problem was still there, and the state had to do things. It had to move into, more or less, to force the big landowners to give up some of their land, that kind of thing. And by the time you reach 1911, the state is taking over things like pensions, um, unemployment insurance, all of which had been done quite successfully, privately, before then. And the English state got a good reputation in, uh, if you look at the official histories of the First World War, for instance, the way in which the English ran their, uh, ran their war effort, it, was, it, was, it, it had far less inflation than anywhere else, for a start. Then comes the second war, then comes the big disaster. And this is something where I'm a bit critical of the Austrian school. The big disaster, the slump of the 1930s, when Keynes came up and said, in effect, I'm simplifying absurdly, that uh, the state must come in, wave its wand, don't bother about inflationary finance, just get people working again. And in the Second World War, I can remember this as a, quite a small boy, we all thought that the British state had performed wonderfully. We were all together. We had won the war. Now, that picture has been chipped away at, not least by Corelli Barnett in a very good book, pointing out just what went wrong with the state. With the state. And the fact is that um, a lot of the British war effort really came from America, even before America came into the war. And it worked, it worked quite well. And there's an illusion that the state can do things. So British, uh, British economics abandoned the uh, pre-Keynesian lines, if you want, Marshall, and took up uh, all the economists in 1960 are Keynesians. And there is one point of this that I just do not understand. Around about 1960, uh, the general idea was that the state would step in and abolish unemployment. 
there wasn't any unemployment. Uh, everybody suddenly starts taking on debt. Uh, the Americans with Kennedy, uh, England with the Macmillan government. Even Germany put, took on a tiny debt in 1964, probably as a maneuver to get rid of Adenauer. And uh, why, quite why Keynes triumphed in the 1960s, a decade of stunning prosperity, is just a, is something I find inexplicable. Now that ended badly in the 70s, inflation, stagnation, all that. So the Austrians, there's a kind of counterattack with uh, Margaret Thatcher and monetarists, this kind of thing. Uh, but it's curious that the English uh, tradition in economics moved off in a Keynesian direction, whereas uh, the, with the Austrians, it's another matter. And I want to talk a bit now about um, what the background to this is. Um, Central Europe uh, is, I don't need to tell you, uh, a, a powerhouse uh, intellectually. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure that you could claim it now, but uh, in fact you couldn't. But uh, both, um, uh, both uh, Britain and America were hit by great force by this wave of emigrants. Uh, some, but by no means all, of Jewish origin. And whatever you look into in, <coughs> in uh, Britain or America, you will find the presence of these Central Europeans. Um, uh, I mean, I've been around for a long time, so I knew some of them. And I think my prize goes to a man called Ernst Gombrich. I don't know if he's at all remembered. He wrote a stunningly good history of Western art. And he was a great globe-shaped figure with globe eyes. And um, I met him at something or other, and I said, uh, are you uh, the son of the uh, uh, Gombrich who um, developed the icon I iconographic tradition in art history? And he said, no, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> you, could, you could find people of this kind in any position of great. We've all profited enormously from them, of course. <coughs> and that tradition of, oh, um, the education system, I, I've got my doubts about it. Uh, there were 40 economists associated with the Austrian school. Uh, Two-thirds of the students in the Habsburg monarchy studied law. And if you study law in German, it is, oh, that is something. And um, so they have to go through that. Uh, their range of reference is formidable. They can look at things from a philosophical perspective. <coughs> and they, they can also handle mathematics, so it wasn't uh, all important to them. And that educational tradition, with things that are right and things that are wrong, is responsible for a, an awful lot of what happens. Now, the next thing is, in the Habsburg monarchy, is that the state did not work, even in 1914. There's a famous book about it, uh, what's his name? Me, um, Musil, who said, this is a state which imitates itself. Ein Staat does sich selber mitmacht. And you were aware all the time of being in a kind of surrealist uh, condition. In 1914, at a time when uh, public employment was not common, and certainly not in England. In, fr in, uh, Austria, in Austria, 25 percent of people were employed by the state, which is an enormous figure for that time. Uh, there were more judges in the Supreme Court of the Kingdom of Bohemia in Prague than there were in the Supreme Court of the whole of the British Empire. And with this, um, this multiplication of uh, 
of the of public jobs, the whole business of the, the if everything becomes waterlogged. Um, taxes were three huge volumes, very thinly printed, on both sides of paper, and you couldn't really find your way around it. I mean, in, I think in uh, in the States and Britain now, it's not unlike that, is it? Um, and so, in a sense, uh, Austria is, uh, presents the problem of the modern state in a way that we're now uh, conscious of. And the Austrian economists, uh, as they come up, really are looking for some way out of, of this, uh, this terrible tangle that they are having to live with. Now, why did it develop like that? And here I, I, here I might... Uh, allude to something that was uh, um, uh, Tony Daniels was talking about yesterday, the idea of rights. Uh, the Habsburg monarchy was a complicated place. When they mobilized in 1914, uh, the mobilization posters went up in 15 languages. And uh, uh, of these nationality disputes, the worst was the one between Czechs and Germans in Bohemia, the Slovene one in, in the borders of Italy uh, also became poisonous, but not to that extent, and there were others. Now, uh, I could wish that the European Union would look at the history of the Habsburg monarchy, because it is a terrible mistake in these circumstances to try to run any, everything by a central parliament. You can't do it. Up to about 1860, uh, if, if, if the town council of a place like uh, Budweis, Budjevice, met, there were Germans and there were Czechs. They knew each other. Some old Czech might speak broken German. He was allowed to address the thing in Czech and they would somehow informally work it out. Um, and uh, in 1860, uh, a decisive moment came when uh, the Habsburg monarchy ran out of money and it approached the bankers in Vienna uh, for uh, the Rothschilds and they said, it must be a precondition of help that you have a proper constitution. So they produced, first of all, the October Diploma, which in effect decentralized everything. And the bankers said, we're keeping our hands in our pockets. So a couple of months later, they produce a program for a central parliament, which is dominated by the German liberal element, who thought they had the answer to everything. And they did. They knew about insurance, they could do tax law, they knew how to run a parliament. They would make terrifically good speeches, littered with literary allusions in Latin. Um, and they thought very highly of themselves, which is one of their vast weaknesses. And um, uh, so Austria, in the 1860s, gets its central parliament, the Reichsrat. Now what happens? Uh, in the next 20 years, there's a great boom of progress and the Czechs develop a middle class and they say we want education in Czech, we want a, German, a Czech university in Prague, they got one, uh, there's a German university as well and this is where the collective rights nonsense it gets revealed. One third of the students in that German university were Czech because they wanted to get on in a language in which there are plenty of books to read and so on and so forth. Um, and the result of all this uh, centralization on Vienna is that the nationality problems get transferred from places like Budweis to Vienna and the Czechs define themselves by nationality. Everybody else defines themselves by nationality. Everybody then starts hating everybody. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's an, a, a test case of how you do not deal with problems of that sort. 
And I wish the European Union would learn it. I, I live in Hungary now. And I just think, what is the European Parliament doing? Uh, voting uh, sanctions against Viktor Orban, who's got the support of the vast majority of the Hungarian people. It's none of the European Parliament's business. And if at the end of it, they create a great secessionist block of, in the European Parliament, electing Viktor Orban as President of Europe, that's, they, they'll deserve it. Now, if you're, if you're living in this kind of world, uh, the, you're looking for some kind of formula which will get you away from the, uh, the, this state which imitates itself with its absurd taxes and its unreformability and its terrible era of surrealism. And I think that's where the Austrian school comes in, if I understand it. Mises' biography is wonderful when you look at it. It's heroic. Now, I will make one criticism of them, that uh, they still write as if the slump hadn't happened. I mean, that is really Hayek's weakness when you look into it, is that he couldn't find a proper explanation for that. And they were not at home at all in a world in which there were world wars. I mean, the depression was caused by the problems of the First World War, that's obvious. And I think the, Austrians, the Austrian school were rather at sea when it came to that sort of world. And I'll end up with um, something which uh, I happen to know about because um, I lived in Turkey, and to some extent still do, for decades. Um, one of the finest moments in this country's history was when um, uh, Atatürk changed the alphabet, which has meant we have a literate country. Um, and uh, the old university, which was religious, objected. So he got, he got it closed down and he opened up for business on, as it happens, the, first of, the 30th of January, 1933, when Adolf Hitler was appointed Chancellor of Germany. And immediately, a thousand of the best German academics uh, came to, well, not to, actually, yes, to, to Istanbul and Ankara. There were some wonderful characters among them. One of them was Ludwig von Mises', von Mises brother. Another was uh, Wilhelm Röpke, who can be called the, one of the makers of the German economic miracle after the war. Um, it was in those days, I'll stop in a minute, it was in those days a precondition for teaching in a Turkish university that you should um, uh, learn Turkish in three years and teach in it in five. Now, it is a very difficult language. And poor old Röpke had a tin ear. He just couldn't do it. So rather disconsolately went off to uh, Geneva, or I can't remember where, in, um, in, uh, in 1939. And um, uh, he bumped into Ludwig von Mises on the station platform. And um, now this, uh, I don't want to be too critical, but this is what's wrong with the Austrian school. Mises said to Röpke, if Cobden and Bright had been able to sign the free trade treaty with Louis Napoleon's France in 1868, this war would not have happened. I praise the Austrian economists, but there are limits. Thank you. <laughs>